Hello everybody, wanted to share a recent chat that I had the pleasure of giving on the Logistics Tribe podcast hosted by Boris Felgen Dreher. It was a very good conversation in terms of leveraging social media, building a LinkedIn presence and how to advance your career using all these tools and techniques. I hope you like it. It covers different areas of the toolbox and the techniques that we can use and we can all leverage on in terms of having access to decision makers, getting spotlight and, and being the ones that are more prone to be promoted versus maybe other, other people in the organization. So I do hope you like it. I do hope you enjoyed it and you find it valuable. Do listen in. Hey, Radu, I was um, just looking back and I realized that it's almost exactly to the day one year ago that I last had you on the podcast. Remember for the BVL Digital Podcast, I interviewed you. This was exactly around the time, almost exactly to the date. And what was funny about or strange looking back at that conversation is that the word Corona or COVID did not did not come up at all because it was still before everything hit the fan, so to speak. It was in January 2000, 2020, the infamous year, but no no talk about COVID. So one year later, here we are. What's going on with you? <laughs> yeah. Well, Corona is going on. So yeah, it's, going it's, on. Still, it's still going on uh, very, very strongly. Um, I just had, because, you know, we were talking about the summit that we're going to do for the COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, I was talking to somebody yeah. that will help promote. So he was saying something. Yeah, I saw the summit is about the supply chain of coronavirus. And then I told him, no, it's not about the supply chain of coronavirus. We, we did an no. awesome job about that. So, <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's that's working well. That There's never been a, a broken supply chain there. It's popping up everywhere. Supply is <laughs> plenty of yeah. the virus. Yeah, it's it's easy to joke about, right? And even back, back in the days, and I was just recapping, I was looking back, the episode that we recorded launched in February. And then just a week after, I was attending an event, an automotive logistics event in Leipzig, Germany. And I was sitting across the table from two guys. I introduced myself, like, hey, what's going on? And, and they introduced themselves, and said, where are you guys from? And they said, from Webasto. And Webasto is the automotive supplier that made headlines back in the days as the very, very first person in Germany that was diagnosed with the COVID virus was an employee from Webasto mm -hmm. who had just a week earlier met with a Chinese employee or like a coworker and then everything started from there and we were joking about it even then, you know, even, even then we were joking about ha ha Webasto and better wash my hands. And we were just joking about it. And now looking back, that was just the wrong thing to joke about. <laughs> but um, and then six weeks, six weeks later, eight weeks later, the, the, the country was in complete lockdown. So, and we're still in the second lockdown now. So things haven't quite changed yet. We still haven't gotten it under control, but yeah, Correct. that was my, my recollection of the, of the situation back in the days. So what kind of year has it been for you, 2020? Looking back, what, um, how, do you, how would you sum it up for you personally? Uh, it's a uh, year, a bad year, hard to say, or I mean, how, how's business? How was personal? What's no, amazing, amazing year. So for us, it's been, it's been an amazing year, uh, mm -hmm. uh, basically on a, on a business side, because we have done so many things digitally already. We had done it already. So this whole crisis has a, had accelerated um, the whole process. So yeah. the headhunting business, the executive search business uh, doubled somehow in 2020. Really? Most businesses yeah. uh, well, struggled. So I don't think that there were uh, there was an increase necessarily in hiring, but um, but we did well. And then um, I think we we were fortunate to to do um, two summits, two virtual summits that were extremely well received. And uh, in some ways, I think we also pioneered, if I can claim a little bit uh, and boast a little bit the yeah we we pioneered a little bit in the space of supply chain virtual summits and they were extremely well received and that that helped us connect and make a lot of relevant uh, you know build the platform further so I, I for us it's been it's been good now on a personal note uh, being in <laughs> singapore for the last 12 months, 11 months. I mean, Singapore is an amazing place. I love it. Uh, however, I am beginning to feel a little bit claustrophobic. Um, <laughs> I have not uh, yeah. gone anywhere outside for the last, uh, yeah, almost a year. So from that side, I think it's a bit of a struggle, but you know. Um, you, you're not I'm alone. Like, let me let me assure you, you're not alone. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, I would completely agree with you that you're, as a headhunting business, I think you're, you're very special in the sense that you early on recognized the value of providing more than just a, a, a executive search, right? You provided content 
to a level where this is very, very unique. I mean, you, you've, within a short amount of time, you've really established yourself as a, as a go-to place for, for the community coming together, the global supply chain logistics community to create content together. It's quite amazing. And, and the stuff you do on LinkedIn, we, we can spend some time during this episode sort of diving in there because I think there's some great learnings in the way you guys and you in particular operate um, LinkedIn and, and what sort of presence you have there and the ubiquitousness <laughs> that you have there at least from my vantage point, maybe it's just me, maybe I get inundated with stuff that, that you guys do, but I see it all over the place. And I find it hard to imagine that someone that works in global supply chain logistics and hasn't, hasn't heard of you guys and what you, what you do. So it's just, just going back to the comment you made earlier around uh, business booming. I, I was under the impression, or maybe had, had, had thought that hiring was on hold and budgets were, were frozen and, and sort of hiring slowed. Is that, is that the case or has it reversed or is it just a case where, yes, the overall market has shrunk or has maybe is, is frozen, but your business is booming. What's the overall market for, for, for personnel in logistics and supply chain has been more hiring, less hiring. What's, what's it looking like? As, as an overall, uh, probably it's down. So as an overall yeah. is down, I is by no means booming. We do sit and most of the work that I personally do and the team here in Asia Pacific does is, is Asia Pacific, which as a region has been impacted at the beginning, right? With February, March, April, yeah. but then it's swung back, right? So China is pretty normal, Vietnam, Taiwan, Singapore, you know, a lot of the markets are pretty, you know, pretty much back to normal. Obviously there's some challenges in others, but compared to what's going on right now in Europe or US, it's not as uh, significant. And, lockdowns are not there so i think one it has to do with where we are but two um back to the point where helping people through content and trying to create meaningful discussions relationships and and information sharing that helps the community i think we've benefited a lot because the more we got uh, the more people get to know us and now we've been doing this for close to 10 years right so it's, it's been a while it's not exactly overnight it's been a while um uh Content, I think we've been doing content for three, four years, right? So it's been, you know, I just mm -hmm. want to put things into perspective. It's been a couple of not, good not an, years. Not an overnight success. Not it's an overnight not been success. an overnight success, right? So, but um, I think over time, it's a compounded success because the more you do it, right. the more you add value, uh, the more people come, the more people find you. So I think the success comes in, in terms with us getting market share, right? It's not necessarily that there's more jobs available. It's more that I think we are getting the jobs because we get more recognized in the market and people know us. Right. Not necessarily as headhunters, but ultimately if you go to somebody for content or useful information and if you also have a job, then it's pretty normal that you're going to, or hiring need, right? You're going to go to the same person because, you know, why not? So, I think that's the yeah. trend that we mostly capitalized on. Yeah. I, do you think you're also benefiting from the fact that most traditional trade media, for example, so tra traditional trade publications are all shrinking and they're all cutting budgets and they're cutting back on high quality content producers, for example? Is that a trend that sort of plays into your hand there? I, if I'm to be honest, and I'm not, I'm no expert, but I think we're benefiting on a couple of things, right? So we have, you know, the content that we produce, we don't, uh, we don't produce it for making money. Right. I think that's a huge advantage yes. that we get, right? We do not yeah. do, I mean, we have a podcast ourselves. We have not charged anybody. We have had one time a sponsor. That sponsor has been Amazon. I would have done it for free. They did pay. <laughs> um, but that's that's it. And they were a sponsor, right? So they did a 30 minute, uh, 30 seconds, sorry, 30 second. Uh, but other than that, we have never taken anybody on the podcast as a pay for play, right? We, we yeah. take stories that's that important. are relevant, that are people that are, you know, something, they have something to say. Same with, with what we try to do with, uh, with the summits and with events. Now, on the summits, of course, we do have sponsors and those sponsors do pay. But most of the things that we put out, we don't have an intent to sell sponsorships or to sell uh, advertising, right? Which I think helps in a sense that whilst, you know, we are not a media per se, like every day I need to churn out 10,000 articles. We try to put high quality content out there. And the purpose of that content is to actually inform in an as objective manner. I mean, we don't claim to be a police report, right? But we try to do, put out there good stories that people can learn from. Um, that, is, that, is a, that is a major difference. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, compared to maybe uh, the model of a traditional, if I can dare say like that, uh, trade publication or magazine or whatever, then if you need to monetize your content, then you're kind of bound to put, you know, certain sponsors or, 
you know, articles in front of others because they pay you. And then, then obviously there's a certain element of that. So I don't know, you know, I don't know that, that, that part, uh, cause for us, obviously we do make our revenue, main revenue still is executive search. So then uh, as long as that revenue stream happens, then I don't, need and want and I, I want to keep the content as objective and as relevant to our followers that's the key the key intent is to add value the key intent is not to even sell to be honest uh, executive yeah. session of course does it help us yeah of course it helps sure. us a yeah, lot it's an, it's an add-on uh, effect yeah it's, yeah. it, but it's an add-on effect, exactly. It's not, you know, I'm putting a podcast and in the podcast, I'm all I'm talking about is, you know, use Elka Global as a headhunter. No, I don't do that. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about your podcast. I mean, I've been been quite a fan of, of your podcast for, for a long time. It's called the Supply Chain Logistics Leaders Podcast, or Leaders in Supply Chain Logistics, I should I should say. Um, talk to me about it. What's your, how, how do you, when did it first start to occur to you that you should be doing this? And, and most importantly, how do you how does somebody get onto your onto your program? What's your preferred method of of picking who's going to be on your on your podcast? So for people listening here who want to be featured on your podcast eventually as a dream <laughs> to be on your on your podcast features featured as a leader, um, like what's the what's the recipe? How do we get on there? Uh, I, you know, I don't I don't know if we're <laughs> in that category, right? I mean, we, I'm not Joe Rogan, or you know, I mean, there's some really serious. Um, uh, yeah, with 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 us, and maybe there's that there, there's a lesson there. I mean, I guess the key to success, if if we are to use this as a success, and I think it is a success after three years and almost 200 episodes, and it has grown nicely to now we have almost three to five thousand listeners per episode. So I think it's it's quite impressive. And I'm proud of what what has happened, but I think first and foremost is. We tried something when there was not much happening in the space of podcasts in supply chain. So I guess mm -hmm. we had the audacity or courage or whatever you want to call it. I don't know, creativity, entrepreneurship, whatever. I don't yeah. know what you want to call it. Idea yeah. to start mm -hmm. something uh, when it was quite fresh. And then uh, luckily, you know, because you're going to kind of, and you, you've done podcasts, right? You kind of, and you, you're doing a lot and, and you know this, right? Uh, 10, 20 episodes in, you're like, oh, is this, you know, uh, why don't I have 200,000 people following me? <laughs> and, yeah, uh, you yeah. Know, it's like, well, you know, uh, there was obviously uh, that, but, you know, as, as the feedback was overwhelmingly positive from the people that were listening to it, uh, we kept at it. And, and with time, more people found out about it. And then, you know, it built and built and built and built over time. The speakers that we had initially, you know, a lot of them were my friends or people that I knew, uh, you know, from executive search, executives that we had worked with. And then over time, it built into stories. And, and basically, my criteria was almost, you know, asking after episode 50 or so, I was asking people, you know, what are some of the most inspirational leaders that you have come across? And then I've been mm -hmm. targeting those people and obviously if you have a track record of having done a couple of episodes and they know recognize some of the guests because they're from the same industry and their friends and their contacts then it's easier at some point it becomes a little bit easier to get a ceo or a board member to join if they see that you've had some um, others uh, similar similar caliber so that's that's how so we i i don't necessarily have a recipe i think the key and what we always try to do with the podcast is to get some of the most interesting stories out there uh successful turnarounds whether it's it's entrepreneurs whether it is you know people that have restructured businesses that have created over 20 years you know we had for example the CEO of Agility, he took Agility Logistics when it was 400 people and, and led it to 20,000 people and 4 billion in revenue. And it's an interesting story. Yeah. We've had, you know, chief supply chain officers, we've had entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's about the story, really. Yeah, I, I do get a lot of people writing to me and saying, uh, you know, can you inter interview me? You know, I, I, I would, I would, I would say that's not mm -hmm. the right approach, you know, if you need to, <laughs> <laughs> if you need yeah. <laughs> in general. Right. So, uh, yeah, so that, that's, yeah, that's, uh, I, I guess if, if I can summarize it. Yeah. But I, I do see a similar trend on the work I do for the BVL digital podcast, the podcast for logistics and supply chain in the German speaking market that we do get a lot of inbound requests now these days, especially also now it's starting that PR agencies and corporate communications, they're really catching on to the fact, Oh, here is something, that is really, really a, a very fresh new form of communicating with with an audience, right? There's no no other way to connect or or have have your your execs speak in an unadulterated, unfiltered, 
way for 45 minutes. Give me another another format where that's possible. It's not possible in media interviews or written interviews. Nobody's going to read a script that's 45 minutes long, right? That's just not not in the cards. Nobody's going to sit there and, and watch a video that's that long. And most of the presentations you see at conference, for example, those are, you know, scripted and, and plotted out and PowerPoint and sort of whitewashed and sort of not not the same, you know, directly from the horse's mouth, so to speak, right? So it's um, people are really catching on to to that being a very very attractive form of communication. And you're probably seeing the same thing that the the listen through rates of people actually sticking on, right? So stay, they're staying on. They have no problem listen to an episode that's 45 minutes or an hour long. We have listen through rates of 80 percent where people stay on, right? It's not it's completely counterintuitive to what you're seeing. With videos where people say, "Well, don't make the video longer than thirty seconds; otherwise, people their attention span is so so little. You know, it's not going to work." Here, it's a, it's a different story. They take their time. People, you know, have dedicated time space in their day where they where they listen to an episode, right? And it's it's a way to get smart. I have a lot of we have a lot of young listeners, for example, they're just entering the the the, the field that want to learn from from the the old dog, so to speak, right? From the the, the guys from Agility that you just mentioned that that brought a, a, a you know a company from four hundred people to thousands of people. That's just interesting stories, right? To hear directly from these people that have been these places. It's quite phenomenal. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, if if you know, I, I find it fascinating. I mean, I've personally learned so much uh, over the course of these interviews, and it's it's really incredible stories. And I'm, it's almost like I'm on a mission as well, uh, on a personal mission. And I'm, uh, we're going to focus a lot this year on bringing some more of these stories to life because supply chain, logistics, transportation is it's a lot of unsung heroes. It's a lot of you know, most people that are not within the space do not realize that. The reason why we had food on the table and we didn't starve during coronavirus where lockdowns and we, you know, which still exist right now, you know, is because of supply chain professionals doing their jobs and keeping the flow of goods going. And, you know, it's not only food, it's medicine. It's, you know, now it's the vaccine and pretty much everything. It's just that it's, it's yeah. uh, not uh, well story told. Uh, the, the stories have yeah. not been told in a way that, that, that say the public can, can, uh, embrace it find out and understand it so i think yeah that's that's another mission if you want or or goal for us or or hope for us that with some of this we you know we make it more interesting and i and i think we we give the credit that it is due to all these incredible professionals across the industry of logistics supply chain uh shipping transportation and all the credit mm-hmm. that they deserve for the good work what what advice can we give to people when someone's listening and saying yeah you, you're right we have an incredible story we're a f- fascinating logistics provider or manufacturer or retailer but our story what we're contributing um isn't really been told what, what's some good advice of how to get started to really tell that story and bring it to the outside world other than you know the traditional sort of blog posts or you know, appearing at a at a at a conference, you know, every now and then to give a, a short twenty minute presentation that's canned. Like, what advice would you give to get started with the storytelling and with this sort of making making the stories that are happening behind the scenes more visible? What's uh, what would be your advice there? Well, I, I think it, it does start with a conscious effort as well. Which, look, I mean, truth be told, I think it's happening. So uh, I'll I'll give credit to Maersk. Maersk has done some pretty mm-hmm. impressive pieces of marketing in terms of the last twelve months terms of the change that they've been doing in terms for a b2b business impressive yeah and and i think they're on the right track um so you know if we take that as an example there's many others right obviously i'm you know if you talk ups fedex dhl that have the b2c component uh i think they are doing that marketing piece that that goes directly to people like you and me which are individual consumers and and, and so on but there's huge potentially in general right i saw um on LinkedIn, I saw a post of a, of a logistics company transporting a wind turbine. And the way they did it, it was via a truck and the, the blade of the turbine was 20, 30 meters. So it was literally it looked through the picture as if it was, you know, reaching the sky. And it was a fantastic mm-hmm. capture, right? And then, you know, there was some words, look, we're we making sustainable energy happen, something like that. Uh, it can be as easy as that. Huh? It doesn't have to be fancy. That post went viral. It went to 10,000 likes. And then, you know, because it's, it's, it's impressive, like right? that project logistics mm-hmm. type of a, of a caption, right? But I, I also think that there's a, an element and I'm almost wanting to start a training program for supply chain professionals. I actually might do it to teach them <laughs> how to storytell. I mean, I think the problem is that most people within manufacturing, supply chain, 
operations, logistics, transportation are people that get shit done. They're not people. <laughs> yeah. They're yes. not type of people that are sales marketing. You know, they go and say, "Oh my gosh, this is how we're gonna change and move." And uh, and it's a problem because you know, getting shit done is super important, but also making sure that people know what you're doing is super important, right? Because obviously, if you talk about attracting talent to push the industry forward, right, it's important. Uh, if you talk about having a more in, a prominent role within companies, a seat at the board table as a chief supply chain officer, chief operations officer, it's important, right? So I think that element of conscious um, telling a story consciously going from I have increased my truck utilization from 98% to 99% or from 90% to 97%. I, who the hell cares? You know, I need to tell a different story. You know, if you do the CEO to the board, you know, I've increased our, you know, our customer retention or I've increased our market share. You need to speak to the language of the people that are listening to you and you need to tell that in a way that people are going to be receptive. So I think that's something that the industry still needs to learn. Yeah, agreed. And you're, so you're on a mission. I heard another mission that you're, you're trying to educate people. That, I mean, you mean seriously you want to launch some sort of educational program yes, for people like that okay. serious. I'm, I'm in discussions right now with a good friend of mine she does storytelling trainings mostly mm -hmm. for big companies like amazon dell and so on but you know storytelling is this is a soft skill it's not it should not be dependent whether you're a supply chain or it's 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 a soft skill right so it's just a matter of adding it into the flavor of supply chain logistics transportation adopting it a little bit and maybe using some of the examples within And then, you know, you, you can learn it, right? So uh, absolutely, we're going to do that in the next four to six weeks. We're going to launch a first program on uh, storytelling for supply chain. Wow, that's exciting. I didn't know. So great, great to, to tease that out of this conversation. So um, let's talk about about LinkedIn a little bit, um, because uh, I mentioned earlier, you're sort of the... Sort of the master, you mastered the game of of LinkedIn, um, and I, I consider LinkedIn one of the the key platforms to do this type of storytelling. Yet I see very very few examples of people in the space, logistics supply chain, doing it well. What what what's some advice? I mean, you've also gone the hard way. I mean, you started from scratch with zero followers and zero likes, and you 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 went the hard way. Getting started is is difficult. Um, what's your advice for, for people that, that are serious about starting? How should they start? How should they go about using LinkedIn in, a, in an ineffective way? Uh, LinkedIn is, to me, is the tool. Um, whether you mm -hmm. want to keep your network and expand your network and, and, and build your relationships, which will help in your career and person. And so uh, whether you are looking to hire people, obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a platform to storytell about the role, the company, the culture, and, and, and so on. It's an amazing platform to learn, right? Because you see other people posting and what they're talking about, and then you can interact with them, and then you you, you can learn. So, yeah. for me, I don't I don't understand people that don't use LinkedIn. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's it's you know LinkedIn is not for when you look for a job. I mean, there's the very you know it's like you're having a Ferrari and you're only you know driving it once a month kind of a thing, right? So I mean. Um, It's a very, it's, it's, you're using it minimally if you only go to LinkedIn if you need a job. It's, there's the wrong utilization or the minimum utilization of LinkedIn. So I, I would encourage people to, to use it for all this. So first, it needs to, I think the fundamentals is take the long-term approach. It doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it also depends obviously on your goal. What, what's your goal? But uh, I would say the long-term approach is build and maintain long-term relationships with a meaningful network. Mm -hmm. I think that's first and foremost the goal of LinkedIn. Professionally, obviously, not personally. Professionally. And yeah. uh, in a professional manner, so don't share cats and dogs and you know, stuff like that. And um, and the other way is learn. Learn, learn, learn from other from other people. So I, I'll, you know, maybe it's not a fair to give a fair comparison to give myself as an example because it does have a huge advantage, the fact that We are in headhunting. Uh, yeah. It did help and it does still help that people engage, follow and so on. Now, of course, it's there's a lot of other recruiters that ha don't have at all the same reach or, or, or so on. So it's not just that, but it does help, right? Because yeah, it's an element for sure. Now, if you don't have that, I'll give you an example. There is, uh, and I love to give her example. And, you know, it's, it's, she's, I think, three to five years of experience. She works as a, for a transportation company, Sophia. And, and she's just amazing. She's present she goes to all these virtual summits she came to ours that's where i started noticing her and then she documents what she learns she says you know uh -huh. here's my post here's what i learned you know maybe you find it useful dang 
Uh, nice. She says, yeah. okay, here's a summit that I'm seeing. You know, maybe it's useful for my network. Bang. She's been doing it for about six months. Then she started to get invited to speak on podcasts because her perspectives uh, as a, you know, fairly fresh, uh, fresh person within the industry. Then people started asking her, speaking, you know, podcasts. Now he's, she's speaking at conferences. And then, wow. uh, you know, I found out... Mm-hmm. I found out that she's looking for a job. She's very passionate about sustainability. She loves L'Oreal as a company. All this stuff <laughs> to start to, I mean, she's obviously, uh, we do executive search, so she wouldn't be in, in typically in our, I mean, we're, when we do C-level or senior level, so I, I can't directly play Sophia now. But, yeah. you know, even from there, I, I know about her. I know what she wants to do. And if I ever see somebody from L'Oreal, duh, I'll connect her with, with that person. Yeah. Because I, I've seen her, she keeps popping up, right? So it's that incredible network that somebody, you know, that, that's learning on their learning journey, but being so passionate, enthusiastic, stands out, right? So yeah. that's a very, and she comments and she engages with people. So it, that's, she, she does it best. Uh, whereas what I see that a lot of people do wrong uh, is, you know, you expect fast results, you go in there, then you start spamming people and say, hey, I'm looking for a job, can you help? Like, hello? Like, do you just walk on the street to somebody and say, hey, man, I'm looking for a job? Like, you know, you, you yeah. need to know the person. You need to build some level of rapport. You need to build. And you can do that through LinkedIn. So don't just go for the kill. Use LinkedIn for a long-term, meaningful building of networks and relationships, I think, first and foremost. And second point is, uh, and a lot of people are very scared to share stuff, to share their own opinion, to ask for feedback on LinkedIn. But for me, mm best lessons for, for me and he, especially if I want to take the pulse or if I want to get feedback about an initiative that I'm planning to do LinkedIn for me is an incredible fast way to get feedback from the market super fast because you immediately you get a comment you get I mean obviously you need to be okay with re- receiving negative feedback but it's an incredibly fast feedback mechanism in build yeah I think there's initial fear also I mean if you have few followers and you have if you haven't consistently done this sort of thing it's the it's the initial fear that you put something out there and nobody's going to like it right and you're going to look like a fool I think that's part of the deep down that's a fear that most people have for sharing really relevant stuff is that they they're sort of afraid that it's not going to resonate right so and that's that's that comes naturally with with starting off of course you're not going to have the same response as if someone has done it for five years right you have to start somewhere you know but I think there's this initial um, fear that you know well for rejection and rejection meaning you put a, a cool post that you put all your heart into it and nobody's responding right you're gonna have to get going at it until something sticks and then you kind of have to elaborate and, and sort of double down on what works but you have to experiment and start somewhere and it's also kind of i think leads to to the fact that a lot of people are just sharing links for example and with the expectation of yeah well i'll just share it and i'll, I'll, I'll do my little thing at least i didn't put anything personal out there where where the risk of failure isn't that high, right? I just shared a link. If nobody likes it, so what? But if I post something personal and somebody and nobody likes it, maybe that's that's a little bit more heartbreaking, a little bit more more hurtful. So they're, so they're playing the the safe route, so to speak. I see a lot of that. Oh, and of course, it's a self fulfilling prophecy if you're sharing only links, and you know well because you know the LinkedIn game. If you're just sharing an external article, that the algorithm doesn't doesn't like external articles that lead away from the platform so if all your linkedin game is to find articles you read in some journal and then posting it just the way it is and and, and call it a day that's just not going to lead anywhere because the the algorithm prefers or favors original content as opposed to external content that you found somewhere else so that it's sort of um curation approach where you just find interesting articles and share that a lot of people get stuck at that level and you have to elevate your game and get past that point. I think still see too many people make that mistake. Do you see that too? I mean, even, even for you, if you just share a, a personally written note, for example, about your thoughts, that's going to get a lot more traction than if you find a, like an article in the Wall Street Journal and just share that, right? It depends. <laughs> so it, it depends. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would say not necessarily that something is wrong with sharing links. I, I think the, and definitely the LinkedIn algorithm doesn't encourage people to get out of LinkedIn. However, if you do put a personal opinion about a link, that tends to spark uh, or can spark a debate. Now, I mean, again, the purpose of LinkedIn, it's, and I think we've kind of grown into this society of running off the likes and attention and I think 90% of the people on LinkedIn don't do anything, don't comment, don't, but they are there. It's like Facebook, right? Mm-hmm. Just talking, 
<laughs> but you do not <laughs> yeah. comment, right? So that's right. Yeah, ninety. I don't know. I saw statistics somewhere. It's like four percent of the LinkedIn users actually generate some content. Five, six percent do comment every so often, and ninety percent are just there reading. That's it. They never comment. They never. Uh -huh. So yeah. I mean, and there's introverts and extroverts and there's people. So I, I guess if I were to start from scratch, right, if I were to start with zero connection, obviously, you know, you, everybody has 100, 200, 300 people, you know. So I would say that, you know, you first add the people that, uh, you know, LinkedIn one-on-one, -on -one, right? You add the people that you already know. But secondly, you know, I, I would start by engaging first and foremost. So I would say, okay, you know, these are the target companies that I like. These are the type of people that I would like to interact. These are my heroes, Bill Gates or whatever it may be that is your heroes, Ken Allen from DHL or Frank Apple or I don't know, right? So, um, and then start following them and, and you can start small, right? So first, uh, you make your list. Secondly, maybe you start uh, every day, 10 minutes, you put some comments, right? And interact with the content, especially of, I mean, you don't need to necessarily target only the stars right you can go for the if you're in supply chain you go for the head of supply chain within your region of the company that you would like to work for right and if he or she posts something you say you know you engage in, in one way shape or form you just start there by commenting first and foremost observe yeah. what other people are doing right and yeah. then after a while you can start sharing your own thoughts but again don't expect that people will flock to you however if you have engaged, there's a highly there's a high likelihood that people will reciprocate, right? Because you're building a relationship, that engagement, that commenting, that you know, you're basically engaging with people, right? It's same as real life, right? You meet somebody once, twice, and then you build a relationship. Yeah. So, I think that's that's the way that I would uh, I would uh, think about doing it. That's great advice. I think the commenting function is under undervalued by people. I, I think people generally tend to undervalue the the, <laughs> the value of commenting on what other people have, have written, just like you said, because that also trains the algorithm, right? So if I, for example, comment on something that you've posted, all of a sudden my post that I may do or my comments show up in your timeline more frequently because yes. we've engaged before and that people really underestimate that. And I see too few people uh, making making use of commenting. The smart comment here and there can go a long way. You don't have to find your own content. You don't have even have to own, do your own posts, but commenting in a very, very smart way, strategically with people you want to connect is a very, very smart strategy. That's a really, really good point. Yeah. And then, then I would, I mean, if I'm to add that, some other practical things, right? So I would I would actively connect to people and, and, and expand, expand my network so that I have you know, I don't know, thousands of people within my network. Because LinkedIn is not Facebook. You're not supposed to know everybody. I, I've accepted invitations from a lot of people that I don't know, and I've built meaningful relationships like us, right? We never met face-to-face, yeah, -face, right? Yeah. But we have, you know, yeah, it yeah. feels like we know each other, right? Because we've been, you know, uh, communicating, seeing each other's posts, keeping in touch. So that's the power of social media. So I would expand, yeah. constantly expand the network. Again, in a meaningful way, uh, if you want the head of supply chain, the chief operations officer to connect with you now, you know, maybe don't just send a blank invitation to connect. Maybe say, you know, I've been following, I'm a fan, I'm, you know, make it personal again, right? Even if they don't reply, you can still follow them and get their contact and see every post that they post and still comment on their post, which is incredible, right? So, yes. so that's, that's yeah. another thing. And, and to the point of content, I just want to add, I, I have literally, I don't remember when I actively looked for content to post. I do not remember what I, uh, the key to, I guess, some key to my success, I don't know, if you want to call it like that, is basically I spot what other people share and then sometimes I reshare, sometimes I reshare with my own thoughts, I, I typically, that's that's how I do it. I don't, uh, you know, I'm not looking on Google on what's the most viral or, uh, you know, post <laughs> yeah. because the network, I, I'm, I, the, the fundamental is add value, right? At least I try to do that. So when I see that there's a lot of discussions around a certain topic, I try to also chip in in one way, shape or form around that topic. Or obviously I know also from candidates and clients what their challenges, their problems are. And then I find something that comes in my feed to share around that. But it's not, Active, active is because the network puts it out there anyways, right? So you're kind of yeah. using it uh, into the best, most relevant way for your audience. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about more senior level people. I mean, that's your forte. That's your area of expertise, C-level and above, if there's anything above. <laughs> so VP level and above. So C-level is sort of your your forte. If you are on a on a C-level search for someone and your first place probably is to look on LinkedIn and you're seeing someone that looks on paper like a good candidate. So you look at the work history and it's 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 spot on. 
but there's nothing there in terms of of content. There's nothing there in terms of thought leadership. Does that give you pause? I mean, is that something that is becoming an obstacle to someone getting hired, or is it not? Matter, does it not matter at that level? I, I don't know if there's a hard hard yes or no answer to that. So I, mm-hmm. I think the answer is it depends. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are cases where CEOs consciously stay away from social media, and there's you know obviously when you have a. I mean, I, I would dare say that's wrong. <laughs> but yeah. you know, depending depending on your industry, depending on a couple of things, maybe it's not right. I mean, I would say it's wrong because you, as the CEO, and again, the CEOs and CEOs, one is to be a global CEO, right? I think it's very difficult if you don't do anything as a global CEO. Whereas if you run a cluster, if you run a country, if you run a region, maybe you don't need to be as active, right? So, though I would argue that you are still the face of the company within that region, so you do should you know, use use social media as a way to broadcast your thoughts, the culture of the company and, and the employer brand, right? But when we do a search as a headhunter, that comes as one criteria, but it's not the most important. No, I, I, I would say that, um, and, and it, again, there's businesses and businesses, right? Some businesses you don't necessarily want to be every day on social media and, and writing on LinkedIn. Some businesses you you know, especially if you're more engaged with consumers, I don't know if you're an FMCG or, or whatnot, maybe you want to be more there. So I, I think that the key the key is the right person for the role. I think the key is leadership. Um, you know, how do people perceive? We do we do operate a lot on asking referrals, vetting, um, cross-checking with other people within the industry. And of course, it does matter, you know, if you ask me, uh, who do I immediately think of uh, for a particular position? Uh, it's, it's the, there's a term, right? The more you see somebody because they are active, the more you're likely to think of that person first, yeah. right? Yeah, it's, so a, it's a re- recency effect, right? What you've re- more recently have, have been exposed to, you, you, you tend to remember more easily, yeah. Yeah, so that, yeah. that definitely is there, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that alone will qualify you or disqualify you. Yeah, yeah, you said earlier it's the wrong approach. What would be a good reason for someone to stay Stay off of social media or not engage in it or not be active on LinkedIn. Is there still a valid reason today for a for a VP level or above in a global role in supply chain logistics to not be active on social? What would be a good reason for that? Look, uh, in all practicality, the bigger the company, and, and to be honest, I haven't quite seen companies at the company corporate level encourage social media in a meaningful way. I haven't seen it in a generalized way. So you always have your, your beacons, right? But I haven't, because it's hard. You need to operate within the framework and the culture of the company, right? So I think a lot of people, the higher they go, they are afraid, like, okay, I'm Mm. going to say something that is not correct or that is not, is perceived badly or as simple as, you know, I've even heard uh, there was a friend of mine that was a CEO of a large business. You know, he got some internal politics where people who said, oh, he has so much time, he's on LinkedIn and posting every day. (laughs) Yeah, you that's know, right. There's, yeah, there's, yeah, so yeah. There's, there's a fine balance, but to me, I, I do still think that that as a senior leader and a senior executive within a company, it, you know, I don't know. I again, I don't dare say you need to do it once a week, once a month, but every so often, I think your presence on social media to share an opinion is important. Obviously, you can always share stuff around the company. Um, there is a risk that if you only do things about the company, then it's just a sales pitch, right? But you know, there's always things that you can at least, you know, put yourself out there. Don't be completely quiet. I think that that's, yeah. that's to me, is not a great that's thing. That's a bad, a bad sign. Yeah, yeah. For you as a headhunter looking for, 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 for fresh talent. Yeah, let's, um, you, you pointed to it earlier. And that's, uh, before I wrap it up, I um, want to just p- pick your brains on how you stay smart on what's going on in the industry. I mean, obviously, you need to stay on top, and LinkedIn is just it's one place where you go and find interesting thought leadership and, and content and insights and what's going on with the industry. Give me other other places that are your go-to places, whether it's be podcasts or websites or conferences or what have you in the space that people should be aware of. What's your what's your preferred what what are your preferred channels? None of none of the ones that you just <laughs> so it's funny. There's, okay, so yeah, right. I, if I'm to, I mean, my two genuine sources where I keep a pulse. So first and foremost, I am blessed that I interact. I mean, my job is speaking to people. Fundamentally, as a headhunter, and I, I like to say that I am a connector. We are connecting people, uh, not only for the purpose of hiring, but, you know, businesses coming together and this virtual summit that we're doing. Um, so we do interact with people a lot. Now, the fundamental of any business, if you want to be successful, is to help people. In order to help people, you need to understand what is their problem. 
So when mm-hmm. we speak to people, when I speak to people, I try to understand what's going on in their world. So then my best and safest and and, um, and most reliable source of information of what's happening in the industry is the people within working within the industry themselves, uh, because they have the problem, they have the solution, they have exactly what's going on. Now, my second best, because also I'm not talking to 200 people a day, I'm talking to 20 or 10 or whatever it may be, but, but my second best for me is LinkedIn, because I can spot where a topic of interest pops up, right? You see the engagement, you see the repetition. I mean, it's not it's not rocket science, but you, you can see that it keeps popping up. I don't know. I mean, mm-hmm. coronavirus is already passe, right, in a, in a way. But you can, now it's, there's issues around fairness of distribution of vaccine, right? Or monitoring of temperature, or there's big issues with containers, right? Because the, the container necessary to move goods are not available because there's a big imbalance in between trade from Asia to America versus the other way around. There's almost nothing coming in, right? So the ship needs to sail with empty containers, stuff like that. So if you pay attention, but again, that assumes that you have enough people within the network to pay them because if you're connected right. to two people and those people don't share, then you've got nothing, right? So Yeah. Well, um, it could be very biased. What the two people find very yeah, interesting okay, may not be. Very biased. Now, I, you know, yeah. I, I, yeah, so that's that's the. I, I don't read much news, to be honest, almost none. Uh, I, I rely on the fact that if it is really important, somebody will share it or tell me about it within my network. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 I genuinely don't really rely on news portals or much podcasts. Or So I take my information, one, from the source, which is the people within the industry, which I'm interacting with, and two, actually LinkedIn. So that's the way I do it. Yeah, when you say interacting with, does it mean like old fashioned picking up the phone or really like actually physically talking to people? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, that's our job, yeah. right? As as, um, as, mm-hmm. as headhunters, we would definitely all the time, you know, have some searches ongoing or you know keep the pulse in terms of what's what's going on, what's your hiring needs, what's. But yeah. you don't only talk about hiring; you talk about the business at, at scale, at large. And then we doing some, you know, now, now the summit for vaccines, then there was a summit in Asia Pacific, then you have the summit in a global summit that we did. And you've organized so many panels. For us, we learned so much. And again, but who do we learn from? We learn from the people from within the industry. I, I actually, I, I, I always say that I'm blessed to be ignorant, but I'm open to listen. And, and even this summit of vaccines, we literally pulled it off within three, the last three weeks we started working on it. And now we have a summit that has 2,000 plus people that have registered. There's going to be yeah, featured fantastic. Bloomberg, BBC, CNN, and so on. But why is it going to be so successful? Because people kept telling us, look, put something together because we need to talk about the distribution of vaccines. And all all we're doing in a very simplistic way is answering the need of the market and helping people get together by doing it. So I don't know if it's rocket science, but it does require listening to what people want. Yeah, and how incredible that you're able to pull that off within like such a short time frame, right? So imagine back in the days when you everybody relied on physical events, you would have to plan that a year ahead, right? But with the location and getting people there and inviting people and all the sort of payment for it yeah, and all that and, stuff. And, and, and a year ahead, what happened, Boris? There was no COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so there's, yeah. no, there's no way in which you can plan this. And that's that's why, I mean, I think having that agility and speed and velocity, right, where you can act quite fast. And now, thank God, I mean, in some ways, this virtual setup enables us much faster to create things. I think it's, it's an incredible opportunity. Yeah. So and, and this this episode will probably air at the beginning of February. So we're recording this in sometime what mid, mid, mid January. So beginning of February is when we launch this episode. It will be right before your conference. So, so how, how can people sign up? Maybe I'll leave a link in the show notes. Tell, tell us just quickly the pitch for why somebody would want to attend that that particular conference. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, uh, yeah, it's uh, if you put COVID-19 vaccine summit, you will you will find it all over LinkedIn and, and Google and, and on our website, elkidglobal.co. And yeah, we're, we're, we're putting together the, the best of the best experts that we're going to have from non-governmental organization, World Health, World Economic Forum, uh, UNICEF to manufacturers, Pfizer, GSK, COVAX to uh, logistics, transport, airports, ports, uh, shipping lines, uh, logistics experts coming together. And then we have also medical professionals, excellent doctors talking about safety, vaccine literacy, how do we encourage corporations and, and get people you know, to uh, over the reluctance that exists in some in many markets, right? In terms of is it safe, is it not safe? So it's it's really meant to be a forum where to share best practices around logistics, distribution, manufacturing, but also bigger broader problems and challenges around education about around vaccines, as well as uh, you know how do you make sure that 
poorer countries or lower income countries versus the higher income get access to the vaccines and then build meaningful relationships. So we're going to have also a networking platform at the back end where you can engage with people all over the world. Fantastic. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you like what you heard, be sure to go to www.elcodglobal.com and click the podcast button for all the show notes of the interview. Also subscribe to our mailing list to get our latest updates first. If you're listening through a streaming platform like iTunes, Spotify or Stitcher, we would appreciate a kind review. Five star works best to keep us going and our production team happy. And of course, share it with your friends. I'm most active on LinkedIn, so do feel free to follow me. And if you have any suggestions on what, what to do and who to invite next, don't hesitate to drop me a note. And if you're looking to hire top executives in supply chain or transform your business, of course, contact us as well to find out how we can help.